Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Alice Kaplan, director of the Whitney Humanities Center and professor of French and Francophone studies at Yale. Welcome to this webinar celebrating the reissue this summer of William Gardner Smith's 1963 novel, The Stone Face. I'm grateful to the Whitney, to the Yale Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity and Transnational Migration, and the Department of French and Francophone Studies for their support. We'll be looking at a novel that has been out of print for so many years as issues at its center, racism, police violence, and war and memory have taken center stage in both France and the US. I'd like to briefly introduce our three panelists, each of them an important voice on these issues. Adam Schatz is a contributing editor at the London Review of Books and a contributor to the New York Times Magazine, the New York Review of Books and the New Yorker. He is one of the very keenest analysts of Algerian politics and literature, whether he's writing about Kamel Dawood's fiction or the legacy of French torture in the Algerian war. Adam last visited Yale in 2019 to lecture on France Fanon. His 2019 New Yorker article, How Does It Feel to Be a White Man? William Gardner Smith's Exile was important in bringing the stone face to public attention. But most important of all, Adam has written the introduction to the forthcoming New York Review Books edition of The Stone Face. Tyler Stovall is a French historian whose work on the Red Belt suburbs of Paris, on the history of racism in France, on post-colonial and transnational history have defined a field. I'll mention just two of his many books, Paris Noir, African Americans in the City of Light, where I first learned about the stone face, and his newest, White Freedom, the Racial History of an Idea, where he explores the centrality of white racial identity to an understanding of freedom. He has served as Dean of the Humanities at UC Santa Cruz and as President of the American Historical Association. He is currently Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Fordham. Leah Brosgal is Associate Professor of French and Francophone Studies in the Department of European Language and Transcultural Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her book, Absent the Archive, Cultural Traces of a Massacre in Paris, 17 October, 1961, just published by Liverpool University Press, maps through a series of brilliant cultural analyses, the afterlife of the October 17 massacres of Algerians in Paris, a state crime that was censored officially, but that survived through the work of artists and writers like William Gardner Smith. Leah has lectured at Yale on the representation of October 17, and she was a much appreciated speaker in my War and Memory Seminar this fall. So here's how we're structuring the hour. First, uh, introductory remarks to set up our conversation. Adam Schatz will talk about William Gardner Smith. Tyler Stovall will discuss Paris Noir and the Black expatriate literary scene. Then Leah Gros Brosgal will talk about the October 17 massacre and its representation in the stone face and other works. After these introductory remarks, we'll go into dialogue, leaving 10 or 15 minutes at the end for audience questions. So please feel free to submit questions throughout the hour in the Q&A panel and check the chat where we'll be posting references to works mentioned wherever possible. So Adam, I'll pass the floor to you now. Uh, thank you so much, Alice, for that uh, warm and generous uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking uh, with uh, Tyler Stavall and, and Leah Broskal, two uh, historians um, I uh, admire a great deal. Um, I've, I first became aware of William Gardner Smith's novel, The Stone Face, which was published in 1963, about a, a decade or so ago. Um, via a, a friend of mine, a scholar at Columbia, Brent Hayes Edwards, who has written extensively on the literature of the Black diaspora. And, uh, and then I began to come upon references uh, 
uh, to Gardner Smith's work uh, in uh, Tyler Stovall's magnificent history of uh, Black expatriates in Paris, uh, Paris Noir, and in the work of Kristen Ross. And uh, I ordered a copy of the book because uh, I was intrigued um, and in fact astonished uh, by the fact that uh, the first uh, fictional uh, depiction of the October 17, 1961 massacre of Algerian protesters uh, by the Paris police uh, had been written uh, by a Black American expatriate novelist. Um, in the uh, introduction to, to this, uh, this book, I described Gardner Smith as a long forgotten novelist, um, but in order to be a forgotten, you have to have been remembered. And I don't think, and Gardner Smith was always a very obscure figure. So I became very curious about uh, who Gardner Smith was. Um, he was born in uh, 1927 uh, in Philadelphia. He grew up in a poor uh, neighborhood of uh, Black Philadelphia. And uh, by the time he uh, was in his teens, uh, he had experienced uh, uh, terrible beatings uh, by uh, the police. Um, he became a, a journalist at a very young age. At 17, he was hired by the Pittsburgh Courier, uh, one of the most important uh, Black newspapers uh, in America. Um, and not long after, um, he ended up going to Germany um, uh, with the American military. He served there just after the war for about eight months. And on his return at the age of 22, he published uh, a striking novel um, called Last of the Conquerors. It was published by uh, Farrar, Strauss and Giroux. Uh, and it's about a, a black soldier uh, in Germany who uh, paradoxically finds uh, freedom uh, for the first time in the arms of a white German woman in a country uh, that had just recently slaughtered uh, millions of people on racial grounds. And uh, when I read this book, which is a very uh, a lyrical account uh, of a romance and also a, a devastating treatment of racism uh, in the American army, um, it, it struck me that Gardner Smith was someone who was uh, at one and the same time very interested in issues of social justice and racism and at the same time uh, attracted to complexity and difficulty and uh, one of the one of his great preoccupations was the question of belonging which is at the center of his novel of the stone face about uh, a young uh, black American journalist Simeon Brown 30 years of age who comes to Paris and at first experiences it as a kind of a paradise and falls into the soft embrace of the black expatriate scene um, at the Cafe de Tournon um, around uh, writers uh, inspired by figures like uh, Richard Wright and Chester Himes, uh, Richard Gibson. Um, but then Simeon Brown realizes that in fact, um, uh, there are people uh, who are treated much like Black Americans were back home, and they were Algerians, neither Black nor white. Um, and he's drawn into the Algerian liberation struggle. He arrives in 1960, and a year later, he witnesses the October 17 uh, massacre. Uh, James Baldwin, in his uh, essay on Richard Wright, published just after uh, Wright's death, The Last Poor Richard, uh, lamented uh, that Wright um, had uh, become complacent about French racism. He uh, had begun to enjoy what it was like to be a white man uh, in Paris. I think it was somewhat unfair of Baldwin. In fact, Richard Wright did write about uh, French racism. Uh, but uh, this, 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 in this essay, Baldwin reflects on what he calls the hazards of expatriation. He never wrote that novel, although he did comment on the problem in some of his essays. Uh, Gardner Smith is the one who wrote that novel. And it has a very French theme at the same time because the theme is fraternity, what defines brotherhood. And what we find in uh, The Stone Face is that it is not skin color, it is not race. It is ethical action, it is solidarity. And in the case of Simeon Brown, it means disaffiliating from other black expatriates and joining up with Algerians. Uh, it's a rather bitter account of the black expatriate scene, not what we're really accustomed to. Um, so now I'm going to turn the, turn the table over, uh, turn the floor over uh, to uh, Tyler Stovall, who is really our, our leading expert on Black expatriates in Paris. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Adam. Um, and thank you, Alice, for this wonderful introduction and for organizing this event. And thank you to the Whitney Center at Yale. Um, I just want to follow up a bit on a few of the things Adam said about the stone face and William Gardner Smith and put it into a, a broader uh, historical con uh, context of the whole history of African-Americans in uh, Paris in the, the 20th century. This is, a, this is a community that, um, I mean, had long antecedents, but really began to take shape as a, a defined community in the years after the First World War. Um, the First World War had brought the first mass presence of African-Americans, some 200,000 to France in, in, in the American army. And um, almost all of them, of course, went back home, but a few stayed. And uh, African-Americans stayed partly because they had introduced jazz to France and they were able to use it as a way of uh, surviving, in fact, prospering in the country during the 1920s, during Les Années Fogues. Um, and it's when they first began to develop a geographical community in the neighborhood of Montmartre in, in northern Paris. So this is a community that had, you know, by the 1930s and certainly by the 1940s, had a real sense of itself. And it developed a sense of itself as creating a role in a, friend, in a foreign nation that was very hospitable, very enthusiastic about African-American culture in contrast to the situation of African-Americans in the United States. So thus began what I've called the myth of colorblind Paris. The idea that Paris was a city free of racism and then in particular Paris was a city that welcomed with open arms African-Americans. After the Second World War, this community uh, renewed itself. It had disappeared during the second during during the war itself. Uh, all the African Americans had left virtually, but many came back after the Second World War, and they reinstalled the community. This time, as more of a literary community, headed up by Richard Wright. Uh, but, excuse me. And um, this is the community that William Gardner Smith joined in 1960. So, and it was a very fascinating community. William Gardner Smith found himself in the heart of what was in many ways the heart of black intelligentsia and certainly the heart of the black literary world in the 1950s and the 1960s. And yet William Gardner Smith also represents a broader turning point in this, the life of this community, if you will, the sort of decline of the idea of France as a colorblind nation because if he comes to France at a time of, you know, of great welcoming of African-Americans, he also comes to France in the middle of the Algerian war, France's great uh, anti-colonial struggle. And it's worth reminding people that France was involved in anti-colonial wars from basically 1946 when it began the war to repress the Vietnamese struggle for independence till 1962. So this was a major theme in French history and it is William Gardner Smith that brings an awareness of the, this aspect of French life, which includes an awareness of French racism to the uh, eyes of African-Americans and to Americans in general. So he is the one that more than anybody else really calls into question and ultimately destroys the myth of colorblind France, points out that um, France in many ways has its own kinds of racism just as much as the United States does, and is very explicitly drawn to an assessment of this. He is also the one who in doing so really draws together two of the great movements for justice of the post-war world, uh, the movement for civil rights in the United States and the movement for decolonization in uh, Africa and Asia and Europe. Uh, these two movements have a lot in common and the stone face is one that makes that uh, commonality explicit by exploring the ways in which an African-American would see himself drawn to anti-colonial struggles and see them as part of his own struggle. The, the classic statement, how does it feel to be a white man? Really is very complex because it basically is, forms, Richard, uh, forms William Gardner Smith's way of saying that race is, is, is positional. It is not an absolute, but race and racism depend on time and place. And one can be racially uh, excluded in one context and very much a part of the racial superstructure and part of the racial hierarchy in another context. 
And so it's, it's a fascinating novel that looks at the ways in which racism is defined both in the United States and in France. And then there's the whole issue of its portrayal of the October 17th, 1961 demonstration. When I first lived in France, it was uh, some 40 years ago. And I remembered reading Liberation on October 17, 1981, the 20th anniversary of the demonstration. Liberation had a big three page spread about it. Uh, and it was portrayed in terms that emphasized over and over again how virtually nobody in France even knew that this history existed. And I found that to be true when I asked people uh, I met and nobody had ever heard of it. And some people said that Liberation was lying and that the, it did not actually exist. So, this demonstration forms a fascinating plot device in the stone face. It really brings together uh, William Gardner Smith's arguments about racism, Algeria, and the United States. But it was also, of course, a real historical event. And the fact that it occurred uh, and the fact that he was able to integrate it into his novel showed just how important, not just this incident, but the whole relationship between American racism against African-Americans and French racism against Algerians between uh, decolonization and the civil rights struggle, how important that relationship was and how determinate it was of the 20th century, uh, mid 20th century and as a, whole, as a whole. So I wanna now pass the floor on to Professor uh, Leah Broskat, who's gonna talk a bit more about uh, October 17th. Thank you, Tyler, for that uh, perfect segue. Uh, I came to the stone face through my work on the cultural representations of the October 17th police massacre of Algerian demonstrators. Uh, so I'm going to make a couple of points about how this episode is represented in William Gardner Smith's novel, but also try to offer some broader information about how literature, film, and other cultural texts have stepped in to fill the void in knowledge surrounding October 17th. Um, as Tyler just mentioned, even in 1981, uh, the general discourse in France regarding this event was that nobody knew uh, or nobody had seen or that the event itself had somehow been invisible, despite the fact that it took place in the center of Paris on a Tuesday uh, evening. Uh, so there are, um, there are three texts that belong to what I have called the sort of first wave of cultural representation of October 17th. That is three cultural texts that attempt to represent October 17th in the immediate aftermath of the heat of the action. Um, the first cultural text, if you will, is a documentary film, uh, an hour long documentary film called October à Paris, October in Paris, uh, by an amateur filmmaker named Jacques Panigel. Uh, the second is a poem written by uh, Kateb Yassin, who is often considered the doyenne of Algerian letters. Uh, the poem was written in French and it's called in French, Dans la gueule du loup, uh, which is best translated into English as In the Jaws of the Wolf. And both of these, both the documentary and the poem, focus wholly on October 17th. The Stone Face, however, is the only fictional work uh, from this time period of the early 1960s. And the premise of the novel, interesting, is not ostensibly October 17th. And indeed, within the novel, October 17th, the massacre uh, that took place on October 17th, 1961, doesn't really take up that much space. It represents less than 10 pages of, of prose in a novel that's slightly over 200 pages long. And yet the slenderness of this chapter, I think, belies the significance of October 17th, uh, historically for the protagonist, Simeon Brown of the Stone-Faced and in terms of the cultural production of, uh, of October 17th. So historically, I'd just like to point out that October 17th wasn't just any protest and really can't be swept aside as just another bump in the turbulent decade that was the Algerian war. This was really a significant episode of state-sponsored violence. It stands to this day as the deadliest episode of colonial violence to take place on metropolitan soil. And it remains the bloodiest day in Paris since World War II. Now, interestingly, some of our, uh, some of our listeners might recall headlines following the terror attacks that took place in November, uh, November 2015 in Paris. Often the headlines after that day uh, consecrated it as the deadliest day in Paris since World War II. And in fact, that can only be true if you sort of bracket off October 17th. Um, and this is, this is interesting insofar as it really embodies the ways in which this day and the, the violence of October 17th have kind of been bracketed uh, within the French historical record. Uh, 
So the novel, The Stone Face, comes to its dramatic conclusion with the events of October 17th, making it really uh, the paroxysm of this novel. Uh, and despite having been warned not to get involved with uh, the events, our protagonist Simeon goes out into Paris that night um, and he witnesses in central Paris uh, firsthand thousands of Algerian protesters, some 20,000 Algerian protesters, processing through iconic Parisian neighborhoods and boulevards. And then he witnesses the brutality of the police repression and indeed the conditions of detention as Simeon himself steps in to try and protect an Algerian woman who's being beaten by a, a Parisian police officer as she tries to protect her infant son from, uh, from the blows. And so Simeon, in fact, um, experiences October 17th as both um, a witness to the, uh, the violence and in certain ways as a kind of victim of the violence as well. He's beaten by the police before he's uh, summarily thrown into a paddy wagon and taken to a holding center, um, a sports stadium that had been converted into a, a temporary holding center for Algerians. Um, and where he spends the night witnessing the conditions of, of, the, um, of the Algerian in prison, and then finds himself released from the stadium um, due once again to the type of odd privilege he's experienced throughout the novel, that is as being considered um, privileged and powerful as compared to uh, the Algerians. And so in a way, we also see that the October 17th is a catalyst for his own political thinking, his own soul searching, uh, the soul searching he's been engaged with throughout the novel, um, soul searching about race and racism, his place in France and his displacement from the United States. All of this comes to a head with um, his experience of October 17th. And he finally comes to the conclusion that it's time to leave Paris. Um, I want to observe also that October 17th in, in, within the context of a novel that is largely um, realistic and plausible, um, October 17th is the only actual historical event that is mentioned and narrated in great detail. Indeed, we really feel Gardner Smith's background as a journalist coming out in this passage. It's deeply sort of invested in a kind of documentary reportage. He gives uh, tons of evidence, including um, place names in Paris and, and sites of the violence. And yet curiously, he gets the date wrong. We don't know whether this is intentional or, or a, a typo, but in fact, Gardner Smith writes on October 1st, 1961, the Algerian National Liberation Front called on Algerians living in Paris to go into the streets and hold a demonstration. So there's something very curious about um, the way in which he, we think deliberately um, misrepresents the date. Um, and we can talk about that perhaps in the Q&A a little bit. Um, I wanna just say a few more things about um, how the stone face functions within the context of representation. As Tyler mentioned, this was the very first uh, novel to narrativize the events of, uh, of October 17th. Interestingly, it's an American novel. Uh, it would take until 1983 uh, to, uh, to see the first French novel published that represent these events. Uh, this is a book called Meurtre pour mémoire or Murder in Memoriam by Didier Daninx. Um, and then it would probably take, in my estimation, until 2005 before we get really um, the sort of broadest circulating work, uh, cultural work to represent October 17th. And that would be uh, the film Caché by the Austri Aust Austrian director Michael Haneke, which came out in 2005. And while it doesn't represent the events in terms of um, insofar as it doesn't reproduce the, the, the repression and the massacre, it does make interesting sidelong reference to the events of October 17th in a way that really embodies and crystallizes uh, the way the event itself has sort of lived in, in the shadows of, of French history and in, in, in the shadows of discourse. Uh, so the stone face, um, one of the most interesting things about it, I think, is um, the way it, it so clearly testifies to how visible the violence would have been in Paris on that Tuesday evening. And indeed how threatening the spectacle of Algerian uh, political sovereignty and subjectivity would have been to the nation at the time. It also gives a sense of how, um, how discourse at the time was absolutely crackling with race talk. And this is something you don't have to rely on the novel for this, although the novel does a very good job of it, but we can also confirm this through um, contemporary materials from the press and through archival materials. And, and this is important to underscore because it allows us to construct October 17th also as a racially motivated episode of state terror and police violence, which is extremely important to ongoing conversations about truth and uh, uh, reconciliation in France. And it also makes the stone face even more so a key text for comparative transnational study.
I just wanted to end on, um, if I might, on a quote from the, the novel towards the very, very end that I think is um, incredibly prescient. Um, so as Simeon has announced to his French friends that he's going to be leaving, uh, one of his friends says to him, don't go, you'll see as soon as the Algerian war is over, everything in France will be good again. And to this, Simeon replies, and I quote, it's a long time before things will be good here again. France really hasn't even begun to suffer yet from the things that happened during this war. And I think in the context of a France where we have recently seen a report uh, commissioned by the president on um, how to effect some kind of uh, change in Franco-Algerian relationships. This is the Stoha report. I think we can read um, uh, Simeon's uh, comment as indeed incredibly resonant uh, to this day. And so with that, I'll invite Alice and the rest of the panels, uh, panelists back uh, to the forum uh, so that we can exchange about this, uh, this novel and its implications. Thank you so much, all of you. You're so succinct and you, you make me wanna ask so many questions. I think I'd like to start with Simeon. Uh, with Simeon, with the text, before we move into the, the political and ethical issues. Um, first of all, why the stone face? What about that title? And how does it set up you know, the various premises of the novel? Well, oh, go ahead, Adam. No, no, please. <laughs> no, I was just, I was just going to say, I think the stone face is a symbol of man's inhumanity to man. Um, I think that it, there's also a Sartrean reference mm -hmm. there, um, but I'm not a literary scholar, so I'm not mm -hmm. sure. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the stone face, one of the most arresting parts of descriptions of the novel, and I think, again, something that's historically based in the description of October 17th, is he, sh he shows a policeman beating up uh, a woman and her child, right? And just the idea that somebody could do that mm -hmm. shows how inhuman, how that, that shows they must have a face made of stone, it seems to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he's, and he's, he's in fact working on a painting. He's painting, uh, right, right. He's painting the stone face, this right, unmatched, right. which right. is a reference to this experience that he had of being uh, brutalized. In fact, mm -hmm. one of his eyes was was gouged out. Mm -hmm. There's a patch on his eye. Uh, his eye, he was he was blind, half blinded by, um, mm -hmm. by in a racist attack back in the mm -hmm. States. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It made me think of watching the face of Chauvin as the verdict was announced with his mask yeah. and mm -hmm. looking at it, looking at his eyes and trying to find something in those eyes. Mm -hmm. that was nothing. Right. Yeah, I mean, it functions as this kind of recurring leitmotif in the novel for the face of racism, right? He ascribes it first to the young boy who, as Adam said, uh, gouges out his eye, later to um, a, a police officer in Philadelphia who, uh, who beats him uh, senseless. Uh, and with each of these events of, of, of violent racism he experiences, he, he says that he sees again this face. It's always the same face, the stone face, the face of racism. He sees this again in the French police officer who is who is beating the Algerian woman, and as Adam also mentioned, he is uh, he's an amateur painter in the novel, and so he's also trying to paint mm -hmm. the the stone face. And interestingly, one of the in fact the culminating paragraph of the novel uh, has him uh, slashing up the canvas mm -hmm. of the painting of the stone face mm -hmm. as he has decided to return to the United States, bought his ticket, booked passage, and is ready to go. So there, there's a kind of, there's a certain, I hate to say it, there's a certain triteness to the way this is handled in the book, um, but, but that's also part of the, the way in which he's tried to pull through this thread of, of what the face of racism looks like and how he reacts to it. And that's what's kind of both dated and charming about mm -hmm. the novel. It is, it is quite a didactic fiction uh, about this prise de conscience, this growing mm -hmm. awareness that he has about the stone face. And, uh, uh, the, the notion that the stone face is the same everywhere, which is, you know, his realization toward the end of the novel, mm -hmm. uh, was in fact common to uh, depictions of, mm -hmm. of, of October 17, as, as, as Leah knows. Um, mm -hmm. the, I remember uh, in the film by Panigel, mm -hmm. um, there are uh, references to, um, uh, to the Holocaust in it. And uh, the, right. The, right? And of course, later on, we discover in the late 90s, um, mm -hmm. in, in, at the time of the, uh, 
of the Papon trial mm -hmm. uh, that the Paris prefect who was presiding over this massacre was guilty not only of, of, of uh, war crimes in Algeria where he served as an official, right. but also during the Vichy period, That's the right. deportations. That's right. That's the That's old right. multi-dimensional memory is uh, multi-directional memory That's is right. very much in operation here for sure. Mm -hmm. and in some ways it's a novel about how you translate racism. Mm -hmm. how he translates the racism of his, his youth uh, in his experience of Paris and how, mm -hmm. how different and, and yet how much the same. Yeah. Right. Can we say, sorry, Leah, go ahead. Yes. No, I'm sorry. I was going to say it's just interesting to note that in two out of these three um, cultural texts from right after uh, the October 17th massacre, we have these comparative gestures with uh, World War II and the Holocaust, mm -hmm. um, not just in the documentary, as, as, as Adam mentioned, October à Paris, uh, but also in the stone face insofar as Simeon is involved with a woman who is a survivor of the Holocaust, a Polish Jew um, who has, whose parents have been murdered, who herself was a victim of sexual violence at the hands of a Nazi officer. And so again, this idea that the comparison, um, the comparative gesture is there not just in terms of a transnational um, look across the Atlantic Ocean, but also um, looking to uh, the Holocaust as well. And there's that incredible mm -hmm. scene where, where an Algerian guy is expressing his feelings of racist rage about mm -hmm. the Jews of Algeria, who right. he considers collaborators right. with right. Right. powers and so on. So no one is really spared a guilty conscience in this. That's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and yeah. Simeon himself, uh, we, it seems, has participated in something that is described as not mm -hmm. quite a rape, but like a rape mm -hmm, when he was exactly. young, when he was a teenager. Right. Yeah. In a flashback. Right. Yeah. No, no, it's interesting because that whole link with the, the Holocaust and World War II also exists in Murder and Memoria. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, it sort of flips the script because with, uh, with the Papon trial, it starts with Papon being on trial for his complicity in the Holocaust, and only then does it emerge. The whole history of October 17. Right. In Word of Memoriam, it's sort of the reverse. Exactly. Uh, where you first see the October 17th massacre and then gradually becomes aware mm -hmm. of his participation in the Holocaust. Yeah. Yeah, I remember Vergès was trying to make hay with that um, and and make France incapable of judging anybody because of its own lack of moral state. Right. Yeah, right. that's very interesting. Can we now skip to the end of the novel, which has been much debated, and there's a very brilliant section in Leah's book about, about the decision by Simeon, which is so different. Simeon decides to return to the US and join the movement, yet William Gardner Smith goes to Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, and this has occasioned a debate, including by Paul Gilroy, who thinks that returning to the United States is something of a cop-out. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah, do you want to take that on? It's such an interesting... Well, I can, I can say just a little, yeah. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, I'm not sure why characters would have to follow the trajectories of their authors or, or vice versa. <laughs> um, my understanding though, is that um, originally Gardner Smith had written the novel's ending Mm -hmm. with uh, Simeon uh, staying in France or perhaps going to Africa, but that it was um, at the suggestion of his editor at Farrar Strauss uh, Giroux that he, he, he was highly encouraged to return Simeon to the United States. Um, so this might be one of those instances where the, edi the editorial hand weighed heavier than what the author's original desires or mm -hmm. intentions might have been. Mm -hmm. Um, but indeed, Paul Gilroy has criticized this ending. He calls it a kind of capitulation to narrow demands of kinship. Um, and it's sort of interesting to see how the, the trajectories of Simeon Brown and, and, and William Gardner Smith are then cleaved apart, right? Um, uh, William Gardner Smith goes to Ghana for a time um, where he lives and is involved with, um, with uh, liberation struggles and then eventually returns to France where he lives out uh, the rest of his unfortunately short life. Um, I think, I think it's a little bit of a shame to judge the return of Simeon Brown so harshly. I'm, I'm not sure exactly that it capitulates to anything. On the one hand, it separates Simeon Brown from his um, compatriots, the other black Americans in exile in Paris, but it returns him to, uh, to his homeland to participate in a struggle. Um, and I think William, it seems that William Gardner Smith, what we know from his correspondence is that the decision to stay, the decision not to go back to the United States was something that, um, that haunted him. Uh, that he, he wrote in, in letters to his mother, for example, that um, 
although he felt comfortable in France, he also felt uncomfortable because he couldn't be political. Um, he, he couldn't engage. He was constantly reminded that it wasn't his place to engage in the political struggles in, in France. Um, and and this, this does seem to have been something that weighed on his conscience quite a bit. We also know that several of his other works were translated into French, and the understanding is that he never tried to have the stone face translated into French because he knew he was dealing with a kind of political dynamite and that it would just get him into trouble. I didn't realize that that was partly his desire because we've all, all wondered why it hasn't been translated. It's now in translation at the Edition Bourgeois. It's coming out in October. Of all great time, news. Uh, next October. So it will finally exist in the French context. It'll be very interesting to follow the reviews and so on. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I mean, it, one of the things that interests me about this question, Alice, is that in some ways, the idea that Simeon would return to the United States is the most fitting end to the novel, the way it takes mm -hmm. shape. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you see the novels, or, novels or, as a repudiation of the politics of exile mm -hmm. and an emphasis on the, the unity of world struggles, well, why shouldn't he go back to the United States? Mm -hmm. You know, Why shouldn't he go back to a place where he can be politically active? But the point is, as you say, that first of all, he, William Gardner Smith, the author, did not do that. Um, many others did not do that as well. I mean, all you have to do is look at James Baldwin, who was one of the biggest critics of people like Richard Wright. Well, <laughs> James Baldwin spent most of his, the rest of his life in the French Riviera, all right? He went back to America from time to time to give talks and so on and so forth, but he never went back to become politically involved permanently in America. So, you know, it does say something about you know, the, the attraction of this kind of experience, even for those people that in many ways reject it politically. Mm -hmm. You know, Adam said I mean, something. He did, he did yeah. I mean, of course, uh, Baldwin did go back at a, at a critical juncture. He went back in mm -hmm. 1957 um, and he writes about that sense of survivor's guilt and why he felt moved mm -hmm. uh, to return, uh, particularly in No Name in the Street. Mm -hmm. I, 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 think Gilroy, I think Gilroy's uh, essay is brilliant, but um, I, I, I don't see how returning uh, to the states to become involved in the civil rights movement in 19, you know, in the early 1960s, uh, uh, 1963, uh, in 1961, mm -hmm. this novel could have been a capitulation. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, um, in this novel, he says the reason he's returning is to uh, join forces with America's Algerians. Mm -hmm. right. the, the experience of mm -hmm. exile has nourished mm -hmm. his thinking and has allowed him to place the Black American experience in a wider context of anti-colonial liberation mm -hmm. struggles. Mm -hmm. So it has mm -hmm. widened his perspective and he feels the same uh, desire, I think, that mm -hmm. leads his friend Ahmed, a mm -hmm. uh, young Kabyle medical student, uh, to uh, leave France and to fight in the, in the mountains of Kabylia with, uh, with, with the FLN. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it is consistent at the same time uh, we do know um, that originally uh, Simeon Brown uh, uh, decides to go to Africa. In fact, there are conversations in the novel with African students, none of whom is named. Um, why don't you come build an independent African state with us? You're needed there. You'll be comfortable among your people. Mm -hmm. um, that's the but, kinship. Uh, but 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 he does. But he doesn't go to Africa, of course. I think that was, in fact, um, mm -hmm. a, a request of his editor at FSG. Um, I don't see it as a capitulation. I see I, because he's going under a very different, uh, very different pretext. Uh, mm -hmm. He's not simply going home. He sees home in a different light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not to belabor the point, but narratively, it's totally coherent, right? I mean, we see mm -hmm. Simeon Brown sort of beginning to imagine himself involved in in sort of analogous struggles. I'm just going to quote: he he imagined himself on an Algerian mountain fighting alongside Ahmed. Then he imagined himself in Angola fighting with the nationalists or in the Congo aiding the imprisoned prime minister of Paris Lumumba, then he returned with an ache to reality. And there's also on the micro level, the setup of um, the, the little girl in Arkansas who he sees being prohibited from going into the school. And then the, the children he sees, the Algerian children he sees in the streets with their mothers being threatened by police. And so on sort of the micro narrative level and in terms of all the parallelisms that are set up, it's coherent um, that, that Simeon would, would make this move. Yeah, you seem to be implying that he actually does learn something from this transnational experience of racism. It brings to mind a passage that uh, we've talked about 
where Simeon is, I guess he's on a bus and mm -hmm. he starts thinking of Harlem. He's in Paris and he thinks of Harlem. We actually think, Sarah, do you have the passage so that you can share the screen? Mm -hmm. Great. Adam, do you feel like reading? Sure, I can. Um, northward toward, Har toward Harlem. The further north the bus moved, the more drab became the buildings, the streets and the people. Cheap stores selling clothes, furniture, kitchen utensils. Easy terms, 10 months to pay. Cafes became dimmer, the streets narrower and noisier. More and more children filled the sidewalks. Men out of work with nothing to do and no place to go stood in sullen, futile groups on street corners. Arab music blared from the dark cafes or from the open windows of bleak hotels. Then suddenly police were everywhere, stalking the streets, eyes moving insolently from face to face, submachine guns strung from their shoulders. It was like Harlem, Simeon thought, except that there were fewer cops in Harlem, but maybe that too would come one day. Like Harlem and like all the ghettos of the world. The men he saw through the window of the bus had whiter skins and less frizzy hair, but they were in other ways like the Negroes in the United States. They adopted the same poses, stashing on corners, ready for and scared of the ever possible trouble, eyes sullen and distrusting, dressed in pegged pants, flashy shirts, and narrow pointed shoes. He could almost hear them saying, what you putting down, man? Just playing it cool, just playing it cool, man, trying to keep old Charlie off my back. Old Charlie paced the street, waving his submachine gun. Street vendors shouted their wares in Arabic, fruit, clothes, vegetables. He remembered the push carts in his childhood on 10th Street, the sweating men plugging holes in watermelons so you could taste them, opening fish and cleaning them and scaling them for you, shouting in the mornings, any old rags, any papers, any iron. The odors of rotting food and of cooking mingled in the air and he remembered how they had smelled to him, the fried chicken or the greens, the uncollected garbage in the alleys and gutters. Arab music assailed them from all sides. The blues, where was the blues singer now? In the dismal cafes, men played pinball or football machines or stood at counters, staring at nothing, empty cups in front of them. There were no women. The police paced the streets, their faces hard. Thank you so much. So in the hard faces, there's the leitmotif of the stone face, right? Mm -hmm. It's one of the most written passages, I think, in a novel that uses dialogue, I think, often as a kind of paddle boat to get somewhere in an argument. I mean, mm -hmm. this is very, very literary mm -hmm. and, and layered. And a after that passage, he writes that... Um, that, that Simeon um, expected to be seen uh, as mm -hmm. a brother, mm -hmm. um, but in fact, he's not. He's, he's an outsider mm -hmm. and right. he's suspect, um, mm -hmm. not just because he's not Algerian, but also because he's American too. Right. So well, somebody yeah. has described this novel as the novel of the guilty bystander. <laughs> um, <laughs> you agree? Well, I, I was I was going to mention the, what, one of the other famous passages mm -hmm. in um, in the book where Simeon is walking past a group of Algerians and one yells out, "Hey, how's it? How does it feel to be a white man?" Mm -hmm. Of course, no Algerian in Paris would ever have said that to an African American in the 1960s, right? <laughs> this is not an Algerian speaking. This is Simeon speaking, <laughs> conscience speaking to himself. Yeah. That you know, in other words, all this, the freedom in Paris that he's been luxuriating in is really not freedom at all. It's really white privilege, mm -hmm. okay? He doesn't use those words, but that cl that's clearly what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the first novels I know that, that, that makes that point mm -hmm. so clearly in an international mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, I mean, why don't we, we're gonna switch to the audience question soon, but I wanna ask you to end, what does this novel have to tell us today? How does it fit into the current debate? Mm -hmm. I think you address some of those issues, Adam, in your in your preface about you know the current the current trouble over identity politics versus universalism. I mean, what position does this novel take? Well, I, I, on the one hand, it's very much an anti-racist novel, and on the other on the other hand, it's a rather subtle critique of a politics based narrowly on on identity, as as Tyler uh, pointed out earlier. Mm -hmm. 
um, even the notion of, of, of race is, is situational. Um, he's, he is not black in the way that he is black in America once he is in Paris. Um, it's, it's the Algerians who occupy uh, that position. Um, and he becomes aware, of course, that, that his, um, his black brother, so to speak, uh, the, the writers of the Café de Tournon circle have, um, have uh, become quite complacent about the privilege that they are enjoying in Paris um, and, and would prefer not uh, to be associated with this despised minority. So um, in order to, to, to move into solidarity with the Algerians, he has to disaffiliate from mm -hmm. people around the Café yeah. de Tournon, the black expatriates. So um, to me, it, it, it's very much a novel about the, the grounds, the ethical grounds um, of fraternity um, and solidarity and, and a critique of the notion that, that um, that, that, that race is a sufficient grounds for that kind of solidarity. Um, it also places race in a much more international uh, context, in, in a context of, uh, in this case, of decolonization. So um, in that sense, I think it's, it's, it's refresher, refreshingly uh, heterodox. It, it cuts mm -hmm. against, I think, some of the, um, uh, some of the the rigid and essentialist thinking about uh, about identity that um, ha has become unfortunately I think a reflex um, in in the states in recent mm -hmm. years. Yes. Yeah, Leah, I'm thinking about um, all the work you've done on the invisibility and visibility mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the 17th of October and the mm -hmm. way that he makes it visible versus the way that state violence and police mm -hmm. violence is visible today and how mm -hmm. that has changed. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I mean, of course, <laughs> I think, um, you know, one of the obvious things is technology. Um, there, we have, this, we have this fictionalized account of William Gardner Smith in the voice of Simeon Brown, but obviously William Gardner Smith witnessed what happened on October 17th and recounted it in this novel, um, but we do know, and we have now the evidence that photographs were taken that night. There's photographic documentary evidence of the police violence. Um, if it had happened today, we would have body cams. We would have instant release of this kind of footage. These things would become memes. They would be posted on social media. Uh, clearly in 1961, that's not an option. Um, and indeed the photographs that were taken by journalists circulating in Paris that night were, were censored um, by the government. So while some of them made their way into the press before the press was fully censored, most of them weren't seen until decades after the events themselves. So there's a certain interesting way in which comparing with today, you know, technology makes things visible in a way that it couldn't have in 1961. Mm -hmm. Despite that huge banner across the Seine saying, they drown, right. they drown Algerians. I mean, that's also a fantastic story yes. because um, numerous uh, accusatory graffiti were painted along the Seine in the weeks after mm -hmm. October 17th. And yet they were, as soon as they were discovered, they were guarded by the police so that people couldn't take pictures of them ostensibly. <laughs> and we have one photograph of one of these graffiti that was taken by an amateur photographer who happened to crop out when he took uh, the photograph. He happened to be able to crop out the the gendarmes who were guarding wow. the, the tag. Um, so it's an extraordinary document that also didn't see the light of day until I think 1986, uh, when L'Humanité published its 25th anniversary special uh, coverage of October 17th. Yeah, um, I, want, I want to make another point about October 17th, which at times is uh, not addressed, but I'm going back to my history, my, my own history as a historian of the Paris suburbs. Because in many ways, October 17th is an invasion of the city by the suburbs yeah. of Algerian communities and other communities living outside Paris, coming in, invading the heart of the city and being mm -hmm. destroyed precisely because they are in a place where they do not belong. Mm -hmm. And this is all happening at a time when both the, both the independence of Algeria and the reorganization of the greater Paris area are happening at the same time. So in fact, the, the three new departments that are created outside mm -hmm. Paris are given numbers from the three former Algerian departments once Algeria becomes independent, right? right. So, so there's a sense in which, you know, the, the Paris suburbs are the new post-colonial France. Mm 
Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, in in and and uh, just to I want to just uh, piggyback on that point, Tyler. Um, there there is a a major demonstration that takes place in February of 1962, but the demonstrators are white, white French people in the right. you know, in the right. Communist mm-hmm. Party orbit mm-hmm. at the Metro mm-hmm. Charon. Mm-hmm. Eight, eight eight demonstrators are killed, mm-hmm. and that's what gets remembered. It's right. the Charon right. massacre. It's right. not October yeah. 17. Yeah, right, right, right. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. You it's know, interesting. Go ahead. Just to piggyback off both of those, if I might, um, it's it's true that um, proportionally most of the Algerian demonstrators that came into Paris that night lived outside of Paris, lived in the suburbs, lived in the the large slum that was Nanterre, right? Mm -hmm. But significant numbers also lived within the city limits, but Mm -hmm. were invisible, right? So the event is often figured when it was figured in the press as a kind of invasion of the capital, right? A taking of the capital from Mm -hmm. forces coming from without, ignoring, in fact, that large numbers of Algerians lived intramuros, so within the city limits, but weren't seen Mm -hmm. uh, to the public until they emerged in this kind of spectacular demonstration on October 17th. Yeah, I mean, people that lived in the Chambre de Bonne, for example, on the top floors. Right, right, right. Or, back you know, five men Paris, to a bed, yeah. Yeah, back, back in the days when Paris actually had mixed classes because of those. Yeah. Children, but... yeah. Right, right. Exactly. Listen, we've got some interesting questions and a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. Um, was Gardner Smith influenced by Fonce Fanon, who, like him, connected his thinking about racism and the Black condition to anti-colonial right. struggle, and in particular, the Algerian War of Independence? You know, it's, it's interesting. You, you will not find, even in uh, his work of reportage, Return to Black America, which was uh, published in, I think, 1970, and it's, it's quite an interesting book, a single reference uh, mm-hmm. to, to Fanon. There's, mm-hmm. There are no references to Fanon. He, I mean, he mm-hmm. might have been aware, of mm-hmm. the, uh, he was certainly aware of uh, The Wretched of the Earth. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And perhaps also a black skin white mask. Black skin white masks. Uh, Wretched of the Earth was published in December of um, of, uh, of 1961. Uh, 1961. This novel appears mm-hmm. in 63, so likely mm-hmm. he knew it. Uh, that there is a chapter in the book uh, where he meets two young Algerian women who've been tortured back mm-hmm, home, mm-hmm. and and uh, one of the women says that. Uh, uh, because we've contributed to the Algerian struggle, we can now choose our own husbands and mm-hmm. we will never go back to wearing the veil. Now, of course, mm-hmm. this is a very, turns out to be a very optimistic understanding of what's going to happen in post-independence <laughs> Algeria, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an account that exactly mirrors uh, Fanon's description of Algerian women in year five mm-hmm. of the Algerian revolution or mm-hmm. a dying colonialism, the yeah. essay Algeria Unveiled. Right. So um, my sense is that he probably was familiar with Fanon, but there are no traces, uh, no explicit mm-hmm. traces of Fanon in his work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fanon didn't have a presence in Paris in those years, right? I mean, he was- No, no, he, when he, left, he, he, le- he left Paris and, sorry, he left Lyon in, mm-hmm. in, uh, right. in, in late 1953, mm-hmm. returned very, very briefly mm-hmm. uh, on, a sh- uh, on his way to Tunis in uh, mm-hmm. late 1956 and never came back. So mm-hmm. no, mm-hmm. but, 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 it, but, uh, but Francois Maspero, the left-wing publisher, mm-hmm. uh, published, uh, okay. uh, you know, mm-hmm. L'Enceinte de la Révolution Algérienne and then mm-hmm. Dornay de la Terre. So right. he did, he had a small <laughs> presence in an activist community right. and people who were part of the of the uh, Porteur de Valise circle, mm-hmm. the people who were in the Jean Sans network who were aiding mm-hmm. the Algerian rebels, mm-hmm. they knew about his work. And in fact, there is a character in the stone face named Henri, a Frenchman, mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. is the, the, the one Frenchman who admits yeah. that, that there is a problem of racism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By the end of the novel, he's working with the Porteur de Valise, the, Porteur. With the, the Jean Sans network. Mm-hmm. 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 We have a question about how much um, our, William Gardner Smith's life corresponded to the life of Simeon in the novel. Mm-hmm. I mean, things, I, I imagine the question could involve things like the relationship with mm-hmm. Maria, with a Jewish mm-hmm. Holocaust survivor, or... Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think that, well, there, there is a certain parallel, obviously, because he was a journalist. He had been at the Pittsburgh Courier. He w- mm-hmm. ended up working with, uh, with, with AFP. Um, I don't know that he painted. Um, there's some indication, if you read uh, Hazel Rowley's uh, biography of Richard Wright, that mm-hmm. uh, Maria, the, the, the Polish Jewish survivor, is based on a, an Ashkenazi Jewish woman who had been a lover of Richard Wright, and Gardner Smith ended up kind of stealing her from Richard Wright. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know 
but otherwise their stories very much diverge. Uh, Gardner Smith was, was, was married th three times. Um, mm -hmm. He was, I, the, 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 I think the, the parallels are, are rather superficial in the end. Yeah. yeah. Here's an interesting question, um, bringing in yet another identity group. Was Smith in any way aware of the Pied Noir born in Algeria? For example, Camus. Mm -hmm. uh, estrangement was part of it of the identity of the Pied Noir. Do you think that estrangement can be a concept linked with a kind of feeling that goes on with racism? Mm -hmm. Complex question. Well, the, the Pied Noir were not Pied Noir um, okay. in 1961. Cool. Right. They, they only became Pied Noir when they were quote unquote repatriated to France. That's that's when the term emerges. Um, I, I, there, the the, the uh, there 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 is a reference uh, toward the end of the novel uh, to uh, <clears throat> Alger uh, to French soldiers returning home and to groups like the OAS forming, which were composed obviously comprised obviously of uh, of, of of ultra pied noirs. But I, I I don't think that he really um, certainly he would have read Camus. Um, no one no writer was unfamiliar with Camus' works. But I think the, the, the politics, the political vision that's espoused here has, has very little to do. And in fact, is almost mm -hmm. antithetical uh, mm -hmm. to, Cam to Camus' vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's another complicated question. Why would the protagonist want to exchange one place of racism for another? It seems to me that the American experience can be no place of exchange, especially given the legal racism that he would have met upon his return. Mm -hmm. Well, let me re respond to that. Um, and with a, a bit of an anecdote, uh, one of the people I interviewed for my book, Perry Noir, was a woman who had been, a, uh, she was a black woman who'd been a student in Paris in the early 1960s. And she talked about how black students from America at that time would come to Paris and meet with Richard Wright and meet with all these people. But she said there was a difference because rather than having the idea of they were going to sit at the feet of Richard Wright and learn wisdom and, and create literature and all that, mm -hmm. they would come and challenge him and say, mm -hmm. why aren't you back in the United States? Mm -hmm. What are you doing here? Why aren't you a part of the struggle basically, right? Um, and so I think this novel sort of reflects that, that in effect, people had a duty to be a part of that struggle. Um, you know, this is 1961, 1962, mm -hmm. uh, the freedom rides are taking place in the South. Mm -hmm. For example, there's all sorts of violent incidents going on. People are literally putting their lives on the line. And there's this idea that, you know, you do not have the right to, you know, sit, sit here in Paris in comfort and talk about how terrible things are. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, even Angela Davis, it's very clear she's in Frankfurt studying with Adorno. It's very clear she's eager to get back. That's a little, mm -hmm. a little later, mm -hmm. quite a bit later, mm -hmm. but still the same urge. Here's a, here's a great question, which could be our last one. Yes. So what, what do you guys think are the textual and political stakes of this forthcoming translation of the stone face into French? Thinking, for instance, of how it would interact with the Stora report, which mentions the role of re-editions and translations, mm -hmm. and the current discussions of race in France, which tend to dismiss intersectionality and positionality as symptoms of the Americanization of French public debate. And we have one minute. <laughs> Macron would say it's the very first example of woke culture from America invading France, right? <laughs> <laughs> Except I can't think of a less woke book. <laughs> Not woke, yeah. Um, I think it's gonna go, I mean, I hope it goes off like something of a, of a, of a bomb with no victims, obviously. Um, it's it's an important book. I think it's going to be disturbing. Um, uh, I think, you know, going back to something Adam said, the question of how um, anti-essentialist this book is, that's one of the big lessons to take away. And I would hope somehow that would also uh, inform the debate, um, because I would hate to see it reduced to a kind of essentialist debate, such as mm -hmm. what do Americans know about, etc., um, but I think, I, I, and to answer Jeanne's question, I think the stakes are high. I hope it will have the visibility. I hope the translation will get the visibility in France um, for the stakes to play out. Um, as, as I mentioned, I think in the context of the, the Rapport Stora, it, it's very interesting to have this account come to light in France right now. Invitation to write a critical essay in French on the book. <laughs> That's a wonderful place to stop. I thank you so much.
for being here and for lending your expertise to the celebration. Thank you so Thank much, Alice. Thank you.